Good morning. Good morning. Whoa, that is loud, even for me. How's everybody doing today? All righty. I'm going to go ahead and forewarn you. I have been a mess I, all week long as I have studied this. I texted back and forth to Caleb, and I can't promise that I won't start crying. But I have been a wreck all week trying to dive in to these chapters and understand just a fraction of the goodness and the holiness and the worthiness of our God. We've been in this uh, series on Revelation. And even though it's called Revelation, we know and we keep reminding ourselves that it's the revealing of Jesus to us in this book. It's all about him. We're included in it, but it's really all about him. And we know that we've started studying. We know that John got this vision while he was on the Isle of Patmos where Jesus comes in the spirit and tells him, hey, I need you to write these things down. And the first things that he writes down are these seven letters that go out to these churches. And in them, Jesus praises them for what they're doing good. He encourages them to keep going. He rebukes them in areas that they're falling short and there's sin in their lives. And then he promises and then begs them to repent. He said, if you do, there's blessings that come. But if you don't, there's curses. So let's take a look back real quick at Revelation 119 and see what this whole thing is really about. He told John, he said, write therefore the things that you have seen, those that are, and the things that will take place after this. So he's talking about the things that are, the things that Jesus is saying he sees in these snapshots of these churches that he's looking at. And he's begging change to take place. And then the things that must take place and will come, that's the fulfillment of the rest of the book. The revealing of Jesus. So at the end of this vision with John, the scene begins to change. And then all of a sudden, John says he looks up, and up in heaven, he sees a door open. Wouldn't that be crazy to look up in the sky and see a door open? So let's jump into chapter 4. We're going to start with verses 1 and 2. The title that they give to chapter 4 is The Throne in Heaven. And it says, After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. Can you imagine what that must have been like? He says this same voice that he heard in the beginning that we know is Jesus is now telling him, come up here. I have more I want to show you. And the first thing he sees as he steps in through that doorway of heaven, he's in the throne room of God. The first thing he sees is the throne. Then he sees the one that's on the throne. So we can tell by this that this is a progression that as he looks in, this vision of what's happening begins to expand. And as it does, he sees more and more and more. This throne that he sees in the beginning, it speaks of royalty. It speaks of authority. It speaks of the one that sits on it that has power. And like I say, it's unfolding as he's looking in further and further. In verse 3, he says, And he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow 
with the appearance of an emerald. He who sat on the throne has an appearance of jasper and carnelian. There's another translation that says sardis for carnelian. Um, and basically what those are, they were two precious stones of that day. Um, if you remember ever reading in the Old Testament, the high priest would wear a breastplate called an ephod. And on that were 12 stones. Each one represented a different tribe of Israel. These two stones that it's referencing here is the first stone and the last stone. Beginning and end, first and last, Alpha and Omega. God's word, as we dig into it, we see so many crossroads where the, God, where the word just marries up to each other and it just begins to bring a fuller picture of things as we study it. The jasper gem came in multiple colors, but the most precious one was clear like a diamond. So it would give off a clear or a white or whitish prismatic type light when shined through. And then the sardis or the carnelian was a blood red stone, even redder than a ruby. So John says, he doesn't even describe like I see an old man with a gray beard like he's a million years old sitting on the throne. He can't even really tell what he looks like. All he's seeing is the glory that's emitting from him while he's sitting on the throne. He's seeing red lights. He's seeing white lights. He's seeing the emerald green rainbow. And that's all he has words to be able to start to describe it. It's interesting to me that those two stones, can you imagine the red light coming out, the white light coming out? White in scripture represents purity, holiness. The red represents the blood of Christ. When Jesus died on the cross and they were about to take him down to make sure he was dead, they stabbed him in the side with a spear. Clear fluid came out of it. Red fluid came out of it. All this is on display in the heavenlies, in the, in the holy of holies in the heavenlies. In Psalm 104.2, it says, you have clothed yourself with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. Talking about that glory that's in, is just coming out of him, this light. The emerald rainbow that he's describing. Remember when Noah was in the ark? And then when it was safe to come out, God put a rainbow in the sky. It was a promise that he would never destroy the earth with water again. So rainbows are synonymous with the eternal promises of God. Ezekiel saw a very similar rainbow when he was taken into the throne room. Let's take a look at that and see what he saw. Ezekiel 1.28 the appearance of the brilliant light all around was that of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day. This was the appearance of the form of the Lord's glory. When I saw it, I fell down and heard a voice speaking to me. So let's take a look at verses 4 and 6. It says, Around the throne were 24 thrones. And seated on those thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments, with golden crowns on their heads. And from the throne came flashes of light, rumblings, and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was as if a sea of glass, like crystal, and around the throne, each side of the throne, there was four living creatures full of eyes, front and behind. So we get a little bit more information here. So around these thrones, remember he sees the throne of God, then he sees God, now he sees 24 thrones, then he sees the elders on the thrones. See how this vision is perpetually opening up to him as he looks in deeper? 
Now there's a lot of, th- uh, lot of schools of thought on the 24 elders. Um, some commentaries you'll read and scholars will say that they're all 24 angelic beings. Some people will say that, well, 12 of them are angels, the other 12 are the apostles. We don't really know. It doesn't give us enough information. I tend to have an opinion that as going forward, we will see where these elders are instrumental in interpreting certain parts of Revelation to John. That type of role in the Old Testament is reserved for angelic beings. And so I lean more towards the 24 are all types of angelic beings. Don't know that for sure, just my opinion. The fact that they're clothed in white garments, like we said earlier, talks about purity. It talks about holiness. Remembering some of the letters we learned earlier that Jesus said, if you repent, I'll give you white garments to wear. The crowns that are on their head represents that there's some type of authority that's been given to them in God's hierarchy up there in heaven. Because whenever you wear a crown, that's kind of like a kingly role where you're over something, you're in charge of something. And this part, most of the time when you talk to people about it, they kind of put an eyebrow up like, what are you talking about? I've never heard of this. I think also that this, these elders could be part of what's called God's heavenly council. I don't know if you've ever heard that or ever studied that. But in Psalm 82, verses 1, it says, God has taken his place in the divine council in the midst of the gods, low G. He holds judgment. And then in Daniel 4, 17, it says, the sentence is by the decree of the watchers, another word for the people in his council, the decision by the word of the holy ones to the end that the living may know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives to whom he will and sets over the lowliest of men. So we see that these beings are part of what God does when he raises up kingdoms and kings and things of that nature. And then we don't have time to really dive into it, but in 1 Kings chapter 22, there's a story of where memory Ahab is the wicked king at the time where it talks about in this story how God convenes his council and he discusses with them he says look it's time for Ahab to die how are we going to do it and which one of y'all are going to fulfill it why he wanted a council I don't know he didn't have to have a council but he chose to have one to work and do his things through and I think that these uh, 24 elders could possibly be part of that Um, so let's move on the flashings of lightning the rumblings the thunders that they hear around the throne does that remind you of the book of Exodus when Moses walks up the mountain to meet with God to get the Ten Commandments those same things are happening in the mountain now they're part of who God is isn't it amazing Before the throne, there were seven burning torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And Caleb touched on this, I think, last week. When we hear seven spirits of God, we're like, what? I thought it's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. To clarify that, you know, biblically, seven always means complete. And so a better interpretation of that would be that it's describing, like in Isaiah chapter 11, When Jesus comes, the seven spirits of God or the attributes of God would be fully and completely in him. So let's look at Isaiah 11, 1 and 2. It says, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse and and a branch. Remember we talked about the branch back when we uh, talked about Zechariah? The branch was Jesus. From its root shall bear fruit, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, might, the spirit of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. Those are those seven attributes 
that were complete in the life of Jesus that allowed him to fulfill what the Father had called him to do. And then John talks about before him, he saw this sea of glass like a crystal. And that speaks of the transcendentness of our God, the vastness of who he is. We, we try to read it in the book and just visualize it, but we can't do it justice. We're the ones that stand on a seashore and look out over the ocean and it looks like it goes forever. And we're in all of that. Imagine what John was seeing when he stood in that throne room. Let's take a look at verses 7 and 8. The first living creature looked like a lion. The second living creature looked like an ox. The third living creature had the face of a man. And the fourth living creature was like an eagle in flight. These four living creatures, each of them had six wings, full of eyes all around and within. How do you think, how does that happen? The, and day and night, they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is to come. These four living creatures, we could, we could spend a lot of time just talking about them, but we'll sidebar that for another time. We know that one is like a lion, one is like an ox, one has the face of a man, and the other one is like an eagle in flight. They have six wings. Do you recall when Isaiah saw the Lord? He saw the angels flying, they had six wings, two covered their feet, two covered their faces, and when two, they flew. You see, Daniel, Ezekiel, and Isaiah all had throne room experiences. And they tried to describe it as best they could. But some of the descriptions are a little bit different. Because if we both stand side by side and watch something take place. I might say, man, this, 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 this. And then you would say, oh, that, 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 that. Well, we just explained the both perceptions of what happened. It was just my looking at it. I saw things different than you did. But they're talking about the same type of thing that's happening. So let's take a look at verses 9 through 11. And whenever the creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. Let's stop for one second. The fact that it says all things were created by your will and they exist by your will. You need to remember that verse whenever you're feeling down, whenever you're feeling depressed, whenever you're feeling like I'm not worthy, I'm whatever, I'm in this, I'm in that. Remember that God created you for his good pleasure and that he wills that you live and he wants to draw you ever so close and live in you. Isn't that powerful? So we see that in this scene as these four living creatures begin to worship, it gets contagious in heaven. It provokes the elders to begin to worship as well. And they fall on their faces and they throw those crowns at the foot of him who is truly worthy. You see, chapter 4 in this book is all about our glorious father, Yahweh, our great God and King. So let's look at chapter 5. I tried to stay in 4 and I told Caleb, I said, man, I can't do it. Those chapters are so married together that I got to put them together. I said, if you want to come back and touch on things, there's so much in God's word that we could stay here for a while. But we're going to move into chapter 5. 
This one's called The Scroll and the Lamb. And we're going to look at verse 1. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written on and within and on the back, and it had seven seals on it. Now we know that when we talked a couple months ago, we talked about a couple of passages like in Haggai and uh, in Zechariah where there were scrolls. And then we talked about scrolls were actually where like a king or some type of leader would write out a decree, roll it up, put wax on it, and then he would seal it with his signet ring, putting the royal seal on it. Then it was sent off into the land. Well, when it got to wherever it was going, the person that received it, they had to have the authority from the king to be able to break the seal on it to even open it. So we see a, a scroll now that normally they have writing on just one side. This thing's got writing on the front and the back, and it's got seven seals on it. Remember we talked about seven as completion? What's happening in these seven seals is this is the final judgment decree that's going to go out on the earth. And so the father is sitting there, and he has this in his hand. This is the same scroll that if you read in the book of Daniel in chapter 5, God says, write this down and then seal it up until the time of the end. So let's look at verses 2 and 5. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? No one in heaven, on earth, or under the earth was able to open the scroll and look at it. And then it says, I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look at it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered. And so he can open the scroll and the seven seals. You see, in that moment when they said no one could open it, John wept bitterly because he knew that that scroll needed to be open. He grew up understanding that part of who God was is that judgment's coming. And he knew that that scroll had to be open. There's got to be somebody worthy to fulfill God's plan. And then one of the elders says, weep no more. And it's interesting, we're going to see what John says next. In verse 6, he says, Between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing. As though he had been slain with seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. So the elder just said, Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. But John says, I see a lamb. You see, John saw the one that he knew. He, even though Jesus was glorified, he had talked to him in that previous vision. This is the Jesus he knew in a glorified state, the one that had died for him, the one that had walked with him, had broke bread with him, that he had seen do all the miracles. But the angel was calling him by another name. And we're going to see what that is. It talks about the seven eyes of the Lord in that passage that are the same seven eyes that roam the earth to where nothing is hidden, nothing is covered from the sight of the Lord. That's in Zechariah 4. And then in verse 7 through 10, it says this. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by the blood, your blood, you have ransomed people for God 
from every tribe, every language, every people, and every nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. So Jesus is the one that's worthy to take the scroll. And we see the same response when he takes the scroll. Now, just like they worshipped in chapter 4, the Father, now they're worshipping the Father and the Lamb. They are one. They are together. They had harps. So there was a new song that began to play in heaven on those harps and new singing out of their mouths. Before it was holy, holy, holy. Now it's worthy, worthy, worthy. The first worship was centered around the Father. Now this worship is for the Father, but it's centered around the Son as well. It says in these golden bowls, it was like incense rising up. It was the prayer of the saints. What does that mean? That's your prayers. That's my prayers. That's our prayers of the church. And I believe we're going to find out later if we continue to study further along that our prayers, our intercession, are going to be critical in the judgments of God moving forward. When we get into the other chapters, you'll see where the prayers of the saints are taken and then something happens where he wants us to play a role in it. He wants us to be a part. He wants us to be involved. It blows my mind to think about the goodness of God like that. So let's look at four, five, I mean, the last four verses, chapter 5, 11 through 14. Then I looked and I heard around the throne the living creatures and the elders and the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying in a loud voice worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing and I heard every creature in heaven and on earth under the earth and in the sea And all of them saying to him who sat on the throne and to the Lamb, Blessing and honor and glory, might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Can you imagine this scene? The four living creatures begin to worship. The 24 elders begin to worship. And then every angel in heaven engages and begins to worship as well. Then it spills out from heaven onto the earth. And every creature on the earth is worshiping the Lord now. Isn't that amazing? Can you imagine? John hears these praises and worship move from heaven all the way down to earth. Holy worthy, glorious. We're seeing the beginning of the fulfillment of God's end time redemption. We're coming towards the end of that earthly story. So as I studied these two chapters, the Lord began to show me some things that he had shown me years ago in bits and pieces and I had never really put it together before until now. And that's what I want to share with you. In the book of John, in chapter 14, Jesus makes a famous statement that we all know. He says, I am the truth, I am the life, and that no man comes to the Father except through me. And then Philip says, Lord, just show us the Father and then we'll be okay. And Jesus says, I've been with you this long. And you don't know me. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And he goes on to say that I don't even do anything by my own authority. I hear what the Father says and I say it. I see what the Father's doing and I do it. 
He said, it's the father that's living in me, fulfilling his own purposes. Grab hold of that for a minute. The father was in Jesus, fulfilling the mission. How much more should the Holy Spirit be in us, fulfilling Jesus' mission? Ooh. You see, I don't think we quite understand Jesus has so many facets of who he is. He has so many roles that I think we get tripped up on. Well, I'm going to learn about this part of Jesus. And I want to know about this part of Jesus. And so what we end up doing is we begin to get a bunch of head knowledge of, well, I know this, I know that. But do we know him? That's the question. You see, when Jesus came, even the Jewish people didn't understand it. The whole time they were praying for a Messiah to come, they thought this warrior king was going to rise up with the sword and deliver them from Rome. And then he comes riding in on a little donkey and gets nailed to a cross. They're like, what's that all about? How's that a king? They didn't get it. But he was the spotless lamb that took away the sins of the world. My sins, your sins, if we will trust him by faith. So what was really happening in that moment? Do you remember we talked about the high priest a little while ago? You see, once a year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would have to go through ceremonial cleansing and washing and doing all these things to try and get himself cleaned up to take the blood and crawl under the veil of the Holy of Holies where God's glory was dwelling over the ark. He would do everything he could do to be clean and he would climb up under there after it was filled with smoke and he would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat and he would pray to God that he got back out of there before he got struck dead because he was in the presence of the glory of God. That had to be done every year. But now we see Jesus come in. He nails, gets nailed to that cross. He dies for me. He dies for you. And then in the book of Hebrews, it says he took his own blood. Not the one that had to be done every year, but the perfect, spotless blood of himself. And he ascended into that heavenly temple, and he presented it before the Father. And at that moment, he became our intercessor and our mediator of the new covenant. In the old way of the temple and the tabernacle, the priests went in every year. There was no chairs in there to sit down in. You had to run in and get out and hope everything was good. Jesus presents himself and then it says he sits down at the throne at the right hand of the Father and he intercedes for us. He's in a high priestly role for us. He's an advocate for us. Have you ever seen him in that role for you? Do you understand what that means? Hebrews 12 says that Jesus' blood speaks a better word on our behalf. And I have read the book of Hebrews, I don't know how many times, and the Holy Spirit has a way of lifting things off the page and showing you stuff you never saw before. And I thank him for that. In Hebrews 10, I never really understood this verse until now. Hebrews 10, 5 and 7. It says, consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, this is what he said of himself, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you take no pleasure. And then I said, Jesus said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of your book. See, even Jesus has a scroll. So have we seen him as our spotless lamb? Have we seen him on that cross in our place, taking our sins away? Have we seen him as our mediator, our advocate, our intercessor, our high priest? You see, I beat people every day 
that can talk about Jesus. They have some knowledge about Jesus. But when I get deep in conversation with them, I begin to understand that they don't really know him. They don't walk with him. And I think, gosh, what are you missing? He is the greatest thing you will ever say yes to in your life. He's the only one that's worthy that you would lay everything down for. It's all about a relationship with him. You see, most people are okay with the idea of, yeah, I got sins, I need a savior. But where the hang-up happens is when Jesus says, well, I want to be your savior, but I want to be your Lord too. I want to dictate what you do in your life because my plan for you is way better than anything you can imagine. So in the end, knowing about him is not going to be enough. We've got to have fellowship with him. We've got to walk with him. You see, when John saw that, that lamb slain and the angel saw, behold, the, tribe, the lion of the tribe of Judah, they both got it right. They were looking from different vantage points. See that banner right there? The Lion of the Tribe of Judah. See, we don't realize what's about to happen in heaven. Our high priest has been sitting down for a long time. But he's about to stand up. And when he does, he's going to take on the role of the Lion of the Tribe of Judah. He's going to be a warrior king that's going to take that scroll and begin to institute the judgments of God upon the earth as those seals are broken. And the problem is, if we don't know him intimately in these other roles of Savior, Lord, High Priest, Intercessor, when he shows up as that warrior king, we're not going to recognize him because we've never seen that part of him before. Think about this. Imagine a father that's mild and meek. He loves his family. He provides for them. He protects them. And then on the day that evil comes to his home, he turns into something that nobody's ever seen. And he tears these intruders all to pieces to protect what is his. This is the same one that they used to sit on his lap and he would hug them and kiss their cheek. Now they're seeing a side of him they've never seen before. If they didn't have the love and nourishment of knowing who he was as their father, when they saw that side of him, it would scare them. But they know that he loves them, and that even in this thing that I've never seen before, I know it's because he loves me. He's doing this for me. We got to be able to see him that way. We got to understand the roles that he does. If we don't cultivate a close relationship with him now, when he comes in that warrior role, executing those judgments, we're not gonna, we're not gonna get it. I think that's what Caleb talked about when he was preaching a while back, where he said, if we believe a certain way and then it doesn't happen, we might completely depart from the faith because we don't understand what's going on. We got to get in the Word. We got to pray. We got to get our houses in order for ourselves and for our family. He's calling us. He's begging us to come. Because that warrior king is going to release a new version of righteousness, holiness, and love on the earth. That if we don't understand who he is, we won't get it. So I want to close with Philippians 2, 5 through 11. It says, have this mind among yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as a thing to grasp, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being, and being found in a human form, he humbled himself, being obedient even to the point of death on a cross. Therefore God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name above all other names, 
so that the name of Jesus, it, it, his name, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue, every tongue, will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Jesus was our example. If he emptied himself out to allow the Father to come in and live through him, how much more should we empty ourselves out daily that the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, would come in and dictate what we do? Will you stand with me? We're getting ready to sing another song. And all the songs this morning have been about the worship in the throne room. You see, every time you come in this place and we stand and sing, it is an open invitation for you to join in with what's going on in heaven right now. It's an invitation to take part of what's going on in the throne room. I don't think we understand that. We go to a ball game and we get nuts or whatever. We come in here and we, we may get a every once in a while. He's worthy. God, thin the veil this morning that we would get a glimpse of your glory. That we would get a glimpse of who you really are. Holy Spirit, I just ask you to come into this place, God, and minister to every one of us. Draw us near. You said that you would teach us and remember us about Jesus. May we behold the Lamb this morning that was slain for us. May we worship in spirit and in truth, God. Lord, may we be willing to say that we'll lay our lives down for you this day. Father, have your will and your way, Lord, as we worship you, God. I pray, Jesus, that you would come, as you said in Revelation, and you would begin to walk among your people in this place right now, among the lampstands. God, that we would encounter you, the living God, the one that our souls cry out for. God, take every distraction away. May we only focus on you in this moment. In Jesus' name. Amen.